Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, and welcome back to the Regeneration Podcast. Are you still able to say that? <laughs> I like how more people watch the YouTube than the podcast. So it's very close than listen to the podcast, but we always call it the podcast. That's, that's what I'm just stuck in my language. Uh, so you'll notice I'm overdressed today, Michael. You do look overdressed. You're really handsome, but kind of would No, I'm not overdressed that way, but like I have too many clothes on. It's for late May in Michigan. We had frost this morning. Oh, uh, we didn't get it. There was a frost warning, but my plans did not take I mean, it. Wasn't, it wasn't a hard frost, but it was frost, which is uh, pretty late. I mean, it, I mean, it's this is our, around our last frost date, I think, is the 27th. You're further away than from the lake than I would have guessed. So Lake Ontario. I'm in the middle of the state, yeah. I'm 45 miles south of Lake Ontario, but still, even though it's early spring and the water's not too warm, I didn't get a frost while, you know, paradoxically, places far south of me got a frost. So yeah. the lake starts putting out its kind of covering protection. But nevertheless, <laughs> even though, yeah, for a farmer, late frost is not a fun thing, but we didn't, it wasn't too bad. But I have been... I really, and I, I don't know if you saw my my Substack recently, Mike. I didn't see this week's yet. I I noted Which, it. What did I? Well, it's actually called it uh, News from the Morning Star. And you begin it's, with it's, uh, the swallows returning to. Uh... Well, yeah, and but the thing is, people might know that the name of our farm is Stella Matutina, which means the Morning Star, and it used to be called the Morning Star. But apparently, there's some sausage they sell at grocery stores, and every time I met somebody, I said, "What's the name of your farm?" Still, so, uh. Morning Star. They'd say, "Oh, you're the sausage guy." So, no, it's not us. So that's why we changed it to the Latin version of Morning Star. So it's gone but, with the to begin with. Yeah. In that that subsect, this when I'm when I bring this up, I I previewed a, a poem from. I told you I'm working on this new collection of poetry. You did. That's uh, the working title is Mythologies, and this happened before I met our guest today, Martin Shaw, but. I, about a year and a half ago, and this has been a slow process. Usually I can I bang out a book in about six weeks, but I've been taking this one at a very slow pace. And because I'm doing a lot of things in it, but one of the things is I'm kind of um, re-entering re into, I've almost said reimagine, but that's not the right word, re-entering kind of the myths and stories that that I've recognized have lived in me for for my, most of my life, and also, um, kind of uh, I don't know call it excavating, but ex, ex you know using the landscape around me. And a lot of my poetry is you can if people knew where I live, they could say, "Oh, yeah, it's this place, it's this place." Um, to see the mythological implications in that those spaces. And I was thinking, I said, you know, part of me this week, I said, wow, Martin Shaw is really getting to me. <laughs> and, You're of, but not from that place. Which you know, is but, but I think the reason place. being, you know, I'm, I'm, and I interviewed Martin uh, a couple months ago for the, the next coming Jesus Imagination on the Household of Things. And we had a wonderful conversation. And I realized through the course of our conversation that Martin and I have, have, very similar, and I mean not exactly, but there's a lot of parallel to our biographies and our and our journeys. And I'm really happy to have Martin here to talk to both of us. And Martin's got a book coming out, and I'm have to tell you, Martin, if it's out in the UK already, because it's not out in the states already. A book called Bard Skull, which just it is described on your website as which something can be read as a fable, as memoir, as auto fiction, or as an attempt to undomesticate myth, right? And I'm interested in this. What do you mean by undomesticate myth? What I, hello, men. Uh, and what oh, I mean by undomesticate myth is that a wonderful thing happened about a hundred years ago, and that was fairy tales in the you know Jungian's office to a degree the Freudian's office started to get taken really seriously as maps of our sort of interior conditions and I think that was a move of tremendous health you know the idea that the psyche is fed by images rather than concepts and so that mercifully leads to you know Joseph Campbell it leads to 
uh, Robert Graves. It leads to, uh, you know, Robert Bly, Clarissa Pinkola, Larestes, this great exfoliation of appreciation and excitement around myth that really took off in the late 20th century. But on the other hand, what that means is myth can be seen as entirely interior. It can be corralled, domesticated, tamed. In other words, you start telling the stories what they are, you know, and I, I've known that a lot. I, I think a lot, to be honest, of what is trafficking as myth uh, on social media, for example, is often myth theory or commentary. Mm -hmm. And actually, as long as you're not telling the stories, actually sitting down and telling them, you're talking, but you're not praying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's something essential is not happening in the, the mead hall of your own jaw. And so I suppose the book Bard Skull, which is the account, the real account of a 101 day vigil I did in the forest and everything that led up to it and everything that came after it. I think by taking I, for 101 days, I went out and I told the forest a story. You know, I come from a, a tradition. It's an old bardic idea that the earth thinks in myth. And if you don't know myths and stories, how on earth are you going to talk to plants and trees and rivers? How, how do you dream efficiently in their company if you haven't got something to give them? Mm -hmm. So I went out to give these stories back. I didn't go out on the take. Uh, I was in Canada recently and someone said, what do you think a forest most wants to see from a human being when they walk into it? I said, well, at this point in time, it might help if they stopped eating. They said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, oak is tired of being looked at as timber or two by four. And there's something about the vigil. There's something about stopping. There's something about emptying out for a while that I think is hugely useful for restoring some kind of equilibrium. And so I decided not to take anything particularly, but to be offering something, to be a praise maker. Again, this is an old, uh, you know, early Christian, early Irish Christian and Druidic idea. Uh, and so the book really is, is sort of excavating the journals from that period. I had no idea it would become a book. It was just a practice uh, to see what happened. Yeah. Now, on a more pragmatic note, yeah, it's out in England. Uh, it's not out in the States till September, I don't think. Right. It's it's by far the strangest book I've ever <laughs> written, which was a tremendous surprise when both it was reviewed very favorably in something called the Sunday Times, but also The Guardian. Now, yes, that, that's the right and left. That's the right and left of English literary criticism. So maybe this one time... I've done one book that sort of slipped through the net. Uh, yeah, that that that's it's a, a mystery to me. I like weird. Yes. Um, <clears throat> now that's you know, I, um, one of the things when we talked before this came out, I oh, before I go there. So when was this uh, retreat into the to the forest? This was end of two thousand and nineteen, beginning okay. of two thousand and twenty. Okay. Okay, and where was it? It was uh, it was a small, smallish. It was five hundred acres of old growth forest at the southern part of a large national park here we have called Dartmoor, okay. very near Cornwall. Okay, oh, in Cornwall. Okay, nice, beautiful. Um, but one of the things that came out in our conversation before uh, is, and it. It, it it was just a passing comment at the time, but it, it kind of stuck with me for a while because it resonates with my own biographical journey. And that you mentioned that when you were a kid, and I'm, I'm a kid, I don't mean child, I mean young person, you had a record deal, mm. right? And you said it was with Warner Brothers, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. And so about when was that? That would have been in the really in the mid 90s mid 90s um because i had, i had, no, I, I had i also had a record deal but when i was 18 so the late 90s or late 80s uh but i i had a crap record deal <laughs> but it's how it goes when you're 18 right you got but taken I, but, for a ride you're saying pardon me you got taken for a ride like they were offering no, you no not really 
I mean, the part of the ride was apparently I found out years later that well, I think it was Polygram or Polydor or whatever it was wanted wanted to sign us and re-record the album, and our manager said, "No way, it's perfect now." No, okay. it wasn't. But we had kind of a regional hit, like I mentioned before. I mean, back in those days, you could put out a single and make thirty thousand dollars on it. Mm -hmm. you know? which was a lot of money of course that was that was a lot of money in those days but it was also almost enough to pay for the recording right, right, right. <laughs> like nowadays um what kind of music were you playing then mark oh i was playing punk rock you know uh, really real punk <clears throat> rock uh very very fast very loud uh i i was and i was and am very influenced by the kind of diy element of punk not really the first punk bands but mm -hmm. later there was a band called the bad brains band yeah yeah Fuzzy, uh discord records <laughs> uh black flag all, oh, all yeah. sorts of bands from that period they were you know underground bands in the late 80s and i've been on the road in one fashion or another since 1988 since i was 16 yeah mm -hmm. Uh, so that's what I was doing. Yeah, Play, playing the drums. Uh, <clears throat> so a little bit as a as a as a rather nondescript songwriter. Yeah, because well, it's actually I ran sound for the Bad Brains a couple of times, in Detroit. Oh. But the 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 where I'm going with this though is, you know, I I and I know this from experience that a lot of people. And you you mentioned also that you were not a spectacular student before that, right? In school, no, terrible. neither was I. Mm. So, but nevertheless, something, you know, I, how do you see your journey from not spectacular, but bright student to, to, to musician, to mythologist? How, how did that trajectory happen for you? I, I, I think by having no plan B, actually uh i i see again and again <laughs> i see i see comfort and comfort usually as a as if if you're not careful it's it's a sedative mm -hmm. and i see plenty of smart kids smart people who just have so many options that everything gets thinned out but in a strange way as c.s lewis would say it was a sort of severe mercy that at school actually my road seemed clear and rather desperate because otherwise I would have probably just erred back into um, you know, something, something that brought in the brought in the cash. But I, I was in love. I always wanted to be a pirate or a chivalric knight. Uh, and in the absence of that, being a rock and roll musician seemed pretty good. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd seen, you know, I knew of the bad brains, I knew of the CBGBs in New York, this electrifying little punk club, all of that stuff I felt engaged with. Um so I think the most important thing is, funnily enough, the woman that signed me to Warner Brothers was a woman called Sass Metcalf. It was a publishing deal, actually, not a record deal, which, as you know, publishing is where the money is. It's not yeah. in the record. Deals. Right. The thing that she said to me at the time, she said, don't really worry about anything till you're at least 30. You know, you, you should just explore. And sure enough, she lived to regret that when I then returned the contract I'd signed with her and went off to live in a tent for four years on the sun uh out in the hills so I I took her at her word <laughs> uh, so I think in other words I think once you discover something that you're truly in love with and you're released from having to study math and science if you're not terribly good at it it all became a delight and in my late 20s I found my way back into painting I loved it I loved the study of art history I, I loved painting and I do to this day and it was just this strange circuitous route but the thing to be honest that binds it all together is a quote from Camus and I don't know it exactly but it's something like this something like this you know an adult's job is to find those one or two images in whose presence their heart first opened and you make a life around it. It's mm -hmm. Campbell's version of, you know, Campbell would be saying, follow your bliss. Right. And so uh, luckily, very early on in life, I had a sense of James Joyce's aesthetic arrest. I've always known what it turned me on and what didn't. I've always, I've always lent towards it. So I think because I wasn't orientated, 
no one had anything invested in me as having some sort of highfalutin academic career. I went under the radar. I lived for a long time, as both of you gentlemen will, I'm sure, without a mobile phone and without a computer. It's still relatively recent in my life. So I had a kind of free range imaginative education. Uh, and then that really accomplished itself in these four years in the tent, which would have been at the end of the 90s, I suppose. And then I ended up, I mean, but how I ended up doing a PhD and introducing mythology to Stanford University. Um, well, that's just that's that's pro that's providential. That's there's a hand in there that I don't yeah. even know about. <laughs> great, great, great story. Martin, can I ask you, you know, when you spoke previously, you mentioned, and I don't know if I have the words, but almost like the language of the oak trees, if somebody came into it, you might want to correct me exactly what you said. But it, um, the notion when I worked at this Trappist retreat house, there's plenty of Trappist monasteries around uh, Wales where he would camp and everything. The, uh, I was always giving a talk. One of the retreat talks I gave was on the statement, you know, that we we were given the book of scripture because we had lost how to read in the book of nature. You know, and I wanted retreatants there who were there ostensibly to visit the monks and participate in um, the book of scripture. But our retreat house was a, a cool third of a mile, maybe half of a mile from where they would pray. And in the summertime, especially, or actually underappreciated in the winter, it was stunning. But that, you know, to get them to, to take that walk back and forth very, very seriously. So, um, you know, I wanted them to see the connections. And, you know, in retreat talks, we would talk about, say, those things, why might we have lost our ability to read in the book of nature or to hear the language of the birds or the language of trees. You know, I, I posited that two things. One is the scientific gaze, you know, G-A-Z-E. When we look at a tree now, we tend to decompose it into its constituent parts. This tree is, and we use naming of the tree quite often in an unhealthy way, but certainly the scientific gaze, and it was Ivan Illich who taught me how to see this. You know, we re reduce it. So many men on campus now you know, we take so many science courses, they could even look at a woman and see that woman through the lens of composed of this much oxygen, this much nitrogen. And they wonder about the dating crisis on campus. But the other one was you could look at a tree and see how much money you could get if you cut it down, right? Um, you're a poet. Um, we, we probably need to, to return to reading in the book of nature uh, like no other task set before us. You know, can you speak to that a little bit almost you know, the way you might frame your work in this larger narrative. Yeah, some great, great thoughts. Uh, you know, we would all, I think it would be great if all all churches in North America did a year on phenomenology. <laughs> you know, that would be great, just great. And also having an animal as a teacher, those two things would really kickstart something. Uh, and phenomenology in the very, very basic way that I understand it, is just stop telling a tree what it is. Stop telling a story what it is. Stop telling a river what it is. Uh, Latin names count for very little in that atmosphere. It's worth trying to see if you can make a rowan tree blush. That's an old bardic enterprise, and you know possibly you can. But I I remember growing up in the early seventies, going to a Baptist church. And I, in reflection, I appreciate that the sermons were probably useful for, for older folks. But obviously, as a, as a kid, I used to have a repeated fantasy that, that Aslan would appear and sort of smash through the window, sort of drag a few people, a few people around by the scruff of the neck, and we'd <laughs> break out into the living world, and suddenly church would be awesome. Uh, so I simply equated uh, divine ground with, you know, centrally heated, created buildings and actually wild landscapes of copse and bog and cormorant and heron. I didn't feel that as part of the Christian landscape when I was growing up. In fact, it was a place viewed slightly with suspicion because it was a place that pagans were terribly fond of. Mm -hmm. Of course, you read the Bible and you realize it's also a place that God is terribly fond of. It's a place that Yeshua is terribly fond of. Yeah. So uh, it's funny, isn't it? Certain passages in scripture get highlighted and others 
grow dust over them. And I just sometimes wonder if we would all benefit from just sort of removing the, the frame a bit, because actually there's all sorts of moments in, in both the Old and New Testament where, you know, all the action is happening out in the bush. That's where the burning bushes are, you know. Right. That's where God is appearing to us in the form of a thundercloud. It's completely, uh, completely cosmological. So, yeah, my what I would do, Mike, is I would say to someone, look at a tree and give it 12 secret names. It's it's seen as mythologically inappropriate to name things too directly. I'm actually writing this down as like a to do list for the parish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at it. Look, you know, and and for goodness me, if you if there's someone in your life that you're close to, try this as a practice. Do it without to you know just 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 watch them and think there are twelve ways in which I can. I can, I can, you know, predominantly, pre you know, don't critique them 12 different ways. Yeah. We do that already, uh, yes. you know, and, and that's, that's, as you guys will be picking up on, that's very Blakeian. It's a very Blakeian thing to do. It's also very Powisian. You know, John Cowper Powis would say that, like, and I tell students, you know, everything down to maybe a, a, a loved teddy bear or a doll that a girl had hold has residual elements of personality. So to look at a tree, look at some vine going around a fire hydrant and use phenomenology. He didn't use that term, but sink yourself into it, embrace it. And, but give it a person, you know, not give it. Cause you're, you're so right. The, the tagline is don't tell a tree what it is. And obviously in a little bit, we'll get to your, don't tell a story what it is, but this notion of somebody looking at something until you can kind of see a residual personality in these things, or even a clump of trees or an area. I love it. I love it, Martin. Well, so speaking I, of the two books, hmm. Mike, you may recall that when we were looking through a name for the podcast, we chose Regeneration, mm -hmm. which I, I pulled from the first poem in Henry Vaughn's collection, Silex and Tillens. I'll just read you the first stanza, because Henry Vaughn, who was for, for years misinterpreted it as a proto-romantic, he, he, you know, they're, they're like, they're not, he wasn't proto-romantic. They were late Henry Vaughn's. <laughs> they were late metaphysicals. But here's the first stanza. A ward and still in bonds, one day I stole abroad. It was high spring and all the way primrosed and hung with shade. Yet was it frost within and surly winds blasted my infant buds and sin like clouds eclipsed my mind. And for Vaughn, nature, scripture, and the self are inextricably woven together. Oh, and boy, which must made him so like weird that. for his time. Mm -hmm. And he was, I think it was because he was deeply influenced by, uh, especially Jakob Burma and Rosicrucianism of the 17th century. Uh, but, and that's when I, when I wrote The Submerged Reality, that was, I was trying to recapture that connection to nature and to the book of nature that we have lost. And that's when I found Martin's work. I was like, well, this guy's doing the same thing, but in a very different and unique way, which was exciting. You know, I mean, you're kind of, you know how it is. You get excited when you meet fellow travelers along the path, right? So but my question to you, gentlemen, <laughs> would be, we're circling around something that, that many people are interested in. I, you'll know who Malcolm Geit is. Yeah. Uh, I, I asked Malcolm this question. What do you think? I'd love to know both of your takes what do you think a Christian perspective on something like animism looks like? I want to answer the question. I'm not trying to like punt to Mike, trying to think. Um... So mm -hmm. mine would be, you know, um, and I'm really stammering folks, but a Christian one would be, you know, through the lens of sacrament, you know, that, you know, the world as sacramental. Yeah. I would go farther and say that just like you said, Martin, you know, and I'm speaking as a, a, a professional in one sense in the Catholic church, that um, this notion of personality, you know, I think it's worth us exploring as Christians. If, if we're the tradition that gave people the notion of persona to, to realize Martin's ultimate significance, one way, you know, and I would draw the Christian one too, is I'm always drawing distinctions between, and I might've mentioned it last week, but um, right now, 
we have the environmental movement, our common friend, Paul Kingsnorth, you know, he, he saw its movement to these abstractions called climate change. But just last week in the US at least, uh, two weeks ago, we could celebrate Earth Day, but also Arbor Day. And Earth Day can be characterized in a very bureaucratic way, right? Filling out forms in triplicate to send to your UN representative, representative on global warming. Arbor Day has something concrete about it, incarnational, tactile, planting a tree. And um, you know some of these themes, personality, the idea of favoring um, a locale, the divine feminine I'd be raising up because she's quite local. Your work is totally genius on this. You know, we had James Tunney on a couple of weeks ago and my biggest takeaway on a subject as far away as crystals. He just got so dismissive saying that the new thing of crystallography, people read online, they have to get onto a computer and read about some crystal that might help them with their ailment. And he's saying how ridiculous that is. You're encouraging slave labor in Africa. Find the crystals that speak to you locally, right? And so this localism, I would go through the divine feminine, I'd make it incarnational. And this notion of personality and sacraments are some of the key ones for us, because we have a lot to tease us away from this more abstract, I might say, harmonic view of nature. You know, that's shooting from the hip. And I'd say, uh, I think the, the Christian answer to that, well, I think Christendom and Christianity in general doesn't even have an answer to that in, in, in general. But I think what's implicit in, at least the, the way I take it, in the gospel and, and and like mike said the sacramental worldview is that you know it's really touches on david bohm's idea of implicate order that the part is implicit in the whole and the whole is implicit in the part right so it's participatory in that way and i i think you know a lot of the things we see in the world well i know this i don't think uh, a lot of things we see in the world, whether it's environmental catastrophes or uh, just uh, metaphysical catastrophes, are are directly due to us not seeing that. And this is when you talk about phenomenology, right? If we learn how to do that, we <laughs> I don't know why phenomenology is not taught in, taught in seminaries, but uh, if we were if we were grounded in that, uh, the world would be a different place right give us your feedback martin <laughs> give us a letter grade are we good in school or are we not good in school or what's going on here two two, two really refreshing responses um i when i i've been lucky in my life i've spent well over a thousand nights deep in the forest or you know under stars living in tents and the rest of it and even when I was far, far, far away from any conventional Christian form of framing the world, there was always something radiating through a tree uh, or a rock even, or, or the movement of an animal that seemed to be both a celebration of its form, but also something coming from the creator of all of those forms. And I think that's what frightens what frightens a lot of folks that aren't Christian is this misguided notion that everything is sort of dead and inferior, apart from the great Sauronic eye of humans as we we engage in this sort of protracted suicide bid with our own species. Mm -hmm. But for me, a kind of nuanced animism, which again is something Geit speaks about very well, where something is not, not a mountain is not of itself the thing that you worship, but it's the it's the beauteous form that something radiates through. That's a real conversation. I think a lot of people could get behind that, mm -hmm. but it's just something you just don't hear about. We associate Christianity, I think, a lot of the time with a rather breathless, often rather urbanized experience, even though. You know, you look at Yeshua's history in cities, he's always slipping out of them every chance he can get. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He goes in and then he's off. Well, it's interesting. Now, before you, you jumped on, Martin, uh, Mike and I are having exactly this conversation. So, Mike, why don't you reframe that question you, you posed to me? Which was, one well, second, I'm actually giving you a... The, what? The renewal of the church from the rural. Oh, yeah. You know, that um, recently I've been... Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> 
job at my diocese, you know, that um, is, you know, that whole mission part of the diocese as the Department of Pastoral Services. And, uh, you know, so much is administrative now that when we talk about mission, but, uh, you know, in, in sense of church history, if, if I talk about culture, if I say read Oswald Spengler or just think about in American history, the arts and crafts movement, that in times of civilizational or cultural decline, you know, it seems to me that renewal and regeneration tends to come from the countryside, you know, and that uh, I often refer to Chesterton's five deaths of the faith, you know, and that we're definitely going through one now. And where should we look? You know, when things are dying, we all realize, you know, that uh, things are being born. Um, when the seas were sheeting, it's breaking on other shores. And so where are we, you know, we still want to, because I'm not necessarily seeing the new, the new signs yet, but where would we look? You know, and, and Mike was making a good case for the, for the rule, and you can say why, but Martin, you know, uh, speak to church renewal, even at a little more depth, you know, and in terms of nature. Uh, well, I would. I, I think I'd have to say that I'm. I'm probably a little early in the game to yeah. any, <laughs> utter, utter anything uh, too sort of uh, extra. I haven't fermented it particularly. Um, oh. I, I had an experience once. I was walking in Cornwall, and I came to the ruins of a chapel in a forest, and there, to this day, still just it was just a, a wall left and what had clearly been a shrine, uh, and moving through the wall in a kind of a gap into a, an old bowl was clearly a place where there had been, you know, baptisms mm -hmm. uh, and the water was still moving through, you know, the living water. And I suppose it made me think of the, the you know, in, in Ethiopia, where you have those forest churches. Yeah. And the understanding is that it, to have a church without a forest around it is rather odd. It's rather odd. Why would you not? Why would you do that? Uh, so these are just intuitive images of hope and sanity for me, I suppose. Um, I, I'm certainly a rural character, something that's been on my mind actually recently, for some reason when I was traveling across Canada, was the fact that many of the great writers and protagonists for mythology in the 20th century were urbanites, you know, uh, Campbell was a New Yorker really, mm -hmm. and they're used to, in a very exciting way, this isn't a criticism, they're used, used to the breathless proximity of a huge diversity of culture. And it's interesting, it's from people like Campbell that comparative mythology gets born, because you can't help but be a comparative mythologist when there's Chinatown, there's Little Italy, there's where the Irish are. All of that I find fascinating, charismatic, and interesting. But also, there is also the kind of mythology that arises from a place when, as Gary Snyder says, live here as if you intend to live here for the rest of your life. Right. You know, that, that's, that's a healthy thing to do. So I'm, I'm a different beast. I'm a rural beast. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a small holder. You know, one of the things that I noticed in this North American trip was how all sorts of elements of what you would call the old world have been retained more efficiently by those that have left, by those of us that stayed. And part of it is acreage. I was just going to say. You've got more land. you got, got more land. land. Yeah. I, everybody I met had built their own house. Very few people have built their own house around here. Very few people have uh, more than a few domestic animals around. There was musical reels being played that we don't really hear over in Scotland and Ireland anymore. There were, there was even dialect. There was even forms of Gaelic in Nova Scotia that I'd never heard before. Oh, yeah, that's true. Now, in, in Celtic myth, when you went west, you went for two reasons. You went to heal or die, really. So whenever I fly over, you know, and you're flying over Greenland, I know that I'm entering a mythological, I'm entering the mythological Petri dish that is the native, that is the North American experiment, mm -hmm. you know. And I sort of land good-naturedly in that madness. <laughs> uh and I, you know, another thing, so I'm, I'm rambling, but I am walking around this question that you asked me. One of the things that's much more prevalent 
in Canada than where I come from is an almost obsessive reference to human community. Hmm. Before, I, before I'd even breathed a word every single night, someone would get up on stage and thank whoever did the lights and whoever brought the food and whoever did this and whoever did that. And uh, to a point where I almost had one eyebrow raised because it was taking 20 minutes. <laughs> and then I thought to my, because in England, we don't do that. We don't do that. We, we're perfectly civil with each other. But there isn't, there isn't that frontier attention to community that I noticed on the show. And then, of course, I realised they've just arrived. In, in real history terms, you need, you, you, you need to acknowledge each other. You're living in, in, a, in a far more expanded world than what you left behind. So... These are, all, yeah. these are things that I grew to admire. I didn't understand them at first. I didn't know what was going on. But then as I tracked it, like I would track an animal, I began to think, oh, that's probably why they're wired in this particular way. How, that, how, how Christianity refines itself in the rural, for now at least, I would defer to Wendell Berry and your good selves and others. Uh, yeah, well, actually, that reminds me that so this last, this past weekend, I had a, I offered a class or a course on biodynamic farming and gardening. I was just going to comment on that, Michael. Go ahead. And I had people from all over the country show up, quite a few from Chicago, actually, and uh, which is about four hours away. But there was even somebody from Florida and uh, about 20 people and lots of kids. There's a lot of people on the front. But Friday evening, it was raining like hell. And I was going to do something outside, but it was just raining too hard. So I... I did some lecturing inside the barn. And when I finished, some of the people left to go to wherever they were lodging for the evening. Some of the people stuck around a little bit. And I, I went into the house to see who was going to milk the cow and everybody was gone. <laughs> so, so it fell to me. So I will get all the stuff and trudge myself down to the basement and the people said, what are you doing? Milk the cow. Can we come? Yeah, come on. We don't, we don't bother her. We'll, no, you won't bother. So they come down there and I start to get things ready. And they said, would it be okay if we, we prayed Compline? I said, absolutely. So there are about five or six people and they're chanting Compline while I'm milking the cow. I mean, that was, that was it, right? That was, <laughs> that's what we're talking about right there in an image, right? Yeah. And it was beautiful. Um, so, so I think, you know, and, and they felt this too. And I think uh, you saw, I saw that with all the participants is, you know, people being drawn, like you, like you said, Martin, to recapturing some of these things that have been lost. Yes. Without, okay. without, without being, uh, you know, Amish and kind of, you know, re rejecting having a cell phone, but, to recapture something I mean, that's and, and now yeah this this is this is obviously where we're going 2023 is when we've all hit the panic button with ai and should we have phones and the rest of it and it just seems clear as the nose on my face for all of us concerned on such things i don't see any of us chucking our laptops in the trash anytime soon mm -hmm. yet again it's going to have to be and, and this is, you can hear my new orthodoxy coming in. It's passion versus virtue. Now, I have been an unabashed slave to my passions for 50 years. But it's <laughs> my, brief, my brief period of repentance, which has lasted, you know, all of 18 months or whatever it's been, <laughs> I've taken on, you know, the old chivalric notion of noblesse oblige. You know, that's when, when Christ is really speaking to me, he's saying, listen, you idiot. You know, I dragged you out of the dung heap to sit with princes. Now I expect you to act accordingly. Wow. And that screaming and kicking has meant the, de the development, not just of passion, but of virtue and actually keeping some of my passions at a distance. And I now realize I do have a response uh, to your question, Mike, about it's not exactly rural and Christian, but where I do have a dog in the race in terms of experience, of course, is my wilderness vigils. Mm -hmm. And come August, a very small group of us are making our way out back to that very stretch of land where Bard Skull took place and where certain 
things took place where I really entered Christianity. We're going out to simply, it's like, you know, it's the compline in the cow, really, which would be a great essay. That's a great yeah. essay title just there. Uh, it would be great. We're going to go out. We're going to, they're going to fast. Uh, but rather than them being com complete solitude, which is normal, uh, once every couple of days, they come back to base camp, have a little soup. We pray together, maybe read a bit from scripture and just see how do these stories, these ideas, how do they feel out in the forest as opposed to the, as I said, the rather breathless domestic, how is Christ speaking to us through the movement of the roe deer or the movement of the river dart or the rain overhead? I would wanted to offer something. Um, I think Christianity has forgotten it's a dream. I think Christianity has forgotten it's a dream. It's not just a dream, but there is a dreaming element to it. And my dad was, my dad is, um, I have a very young dad. He's only 19 years older than I am. So you can imagine past 50, you're sort of, <laughs> you're not interchangeable. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's fun. It's fun with my dad. But my dad was trying to get me to look back at Lewis's first proper book, really, The Pilgrim's Regress. And there's a bit towards the end of the book where one of the main characters, I think it's a hermit, appears. And he says, Christianity is a combination of what he calls the pictures, the big pictures of the pagans and the road of the Jewish people. And it's the combination of the two that make what he calls Mother Kirk. Mm. Lewis also says that every few hundred years, Mother Kirk starts to disintegrate mm -hmm. and then... The, the landlord will start to send the big pictures again. The landlord will start to oh, send wow, the big wow. pictures. Great yeah. Beautiful. And so I would call them, I, I'd slightly deviate from Lewis. I'd call them big dreams. And this kind of dream time, as you'll be well aware, you're seeing in Aboriginal culture, you're seeing Indigenous culture everywhere, you know. Um, so I'm very curious, 25 years of leading these wilderness vigils, what happens when a small group of folk who are looking to sit quietly in a place and be on um, be on deep listening, but also what happens when we're using, you know, we're we're using, you know, Christ is our druid, effectively mm -hmm. Galilee, right. and so then, I mean, because for me, I, I I kept away from Jesus; he was just too too threatening. Too strange. You said that before, yeah. Feminine wow. in a feminine, a feminine in a weird kind of way. It didn't seem like Beowulf. Uh, I mean, what do you mean? The the you know the last shall be first. What does that mean? What is this? This is this is out of step with the world. Well, of course it's out of step with the world. If the being that runs the world is uh, <laughs> old scratch. You know? yeah, me uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I'm I'm rambling a bit, but that was well, my bit. The Peregrine. Well, there's no. one other one other <clears throat> question, Michael. Is the, a paradigm that kind of captures what you're saying, and it's also a commercial for what you're doing, Michael, with your Center for Sociological Studies and the farm is, and Martin was saying it too. Is you know Martin's a storyteller. I'm sure we're going to get into it more. How the stories are kind of of the earth, or when you say you know we need in the church to do more of that dreaming. But um, one kind of uh, just schematic I've used is that in the decline in, you know, all the, all the big cities of Europe came from, you know, after Rome declined, you had, it was really the liberal arts, you know, so you had all these monasteries and then around the monasteries that led to the resurgence uh, through the liberal arts, you had the big cities form, but the monasteries were inherently rural. I think now, you know, we're seeing this decline but looking at the anxiety of young people, a huge theme for me that all of our listeners know, is that um, I've often told people that the, the next resurgence will come from a renewal of the domestic arts. You know, when we, so again, an anecdote I've shared once here, when the abbot of the monastery was talking to some students and it dawned on him the level of anxiety they feel. And Martin, in the excellent, totally excellent essay on your website, the one and only essay there, you use anxiety, you know, that we're, we look at the history of story thrown on anxiety instead of the earth dreaming these stories. It's brilliant.
But the um, I, I'd like to posit that you know one way of kind of bringing together what we're talking about engagement with Earth is the Abbot said. You know, for this anxiety, you have to do something that works against the grain to inhabit your body again. You know, and so the domestic arts, Michael, teaching people how to engage with soil. You mentioned Wendell Berry, Martin. I mean, it's all where a lot of things are pointing in this direction. You were going to say, Michael. You know, yeah, there uh, just this this topic actually came up. I'm trying to look for it. Um, Here it is. So <clears throat> when I posted this uh, Substack this week, what did this woman say? Um, no, it was, it was last week. So uh, I don't know. I don't have time to look for it, but this younger woman, she wrote to me saying, you know, because she was actually responding to our last podcast on my Substack. And we must have, we were talking about this exact topic and it she about everything me, and nothing, completely identified way. with this. And one of the things, and I, I forwarded it to you. As a yeah, it's wild. It's wild. And uh, she was talking about how lonely it is because so many of her generation, she identified as millennial, are so so much practitioners of conformity that when they when they 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 hear something like what you, we were just saying here, they feel attracted to it, but they're afraid to say anything, afraid to do anything, because of whether it's peer pressure or whatever it is, which is still, I mean, and, and of course you see this in academia, peer, peer pressure doesn't go away after high school. It continues the, the educational system. Um, but it, it was in, you know, I, I didn't know what to tell her other than, you know what? Don't be afraid to speak <laughs> because, because there, I'm sure there are people around you thinking this exact same thing. This is, we all have to go through this way, thinking the exact same thing. And if you, you give utterance to it, you allow other people to give utterance to it. So we're in a way where, all, you know, so many of, of the world right now are, and I think we saw this through the pandemic, which was a, a project uh, control, controlled by fear for the most part. Um, which accentuated that propensity for people to shut up and not speak and not speak the truth, which is why um, <clears throat> I think didn't uh, Rod Dreher write, write an endorsement for your book. And Rod Dreher's book, you know, he drawing on Vaclav Havel, which, you know, uh, live not by lies. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the idea, right? Is and we and we did a we did a show on uh, the parallel polis, one of the first shows we did, right? And I think that's something we uh, that well, I think we need to cultivate. And I think I think Martin, in your work, you cultivate that. I was doing I was cultivating that this weekend. And the more people, and, and the thing is, through social media and other things, you think you're just this weirdo on the fringes of everything, but you're not. People hanker for the real. They do, but how you talk about the real is something that's worth consideration. Because I think in a myth, if you're facing something horrific and frightening, if you're facing what you regard as a monster, the correct way to apprehend it is by looking at its reflection on a shield. Don't mm -hmm. look at it directly because it'll burn you out. Yeah. And in my many years of working with young activists, that what that's what happens because they're inequipped, they're ill-equipped, to have any artfulness in their approach. They think that, st that boldly stating the facts is the truth. But as we know that facts are never the whole truth, they're part of the truth. And there's this deeper, stranger weave that mythology plays a part in. So one of the things I would suggest to anybody that wants to talk about the nature of their times, but possibly without the use of I statements, is to find a fairy tale and there's thousands of them that speak directly to some pertinent issue, but you can you can circle it, not just wag your finger at it. Yeah. Um, I I call it really blue really feather. Cool. Yeah. It's it's it. You look at a magpie and it looks black and white. You're either you either think technology is going to solve all the illness by 2023, or it's effectively luciferic. That is a black and white nonsense that you've got yourself caught up in there look for the occasional blue feather that a magpie has look for the third way if you were to become 
a sovereign in ancient Ireland, your chariot would be would be attached to two wild horses going in different directions. And the business of a good queen or a good king is to dictate a third route that is not just a kind of bland middle ground, but is sparky and innovative enough to calm the two horses pushing in two directions. And again, find a third, to use that phrase, a, a more artful or poetic position, what Hillman used to call a poetic basis of mind. So just as a, a reach out to your friend and to anybody else listening to this, you might just want to consider other ways of approaching the moment that we're in. And in doing so, you'll nourish your soul and you'll protect yourself a bit. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I'm thinking about- Speaking about, of, of which, so last time I spoke to you, Martin, you had not yet entered the Orthodox Church formally. Yeah. But since then, you have. I have, yeah. So in a way, you, you've you've gone into the underworld. Yes, yes, yeah. I have. I've been through, you know, a sort of, um, well, they have, you know, it, 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 it's as near to an exorcism as a modern person is going to get. Uh, you refute the devil, you spit on the ground, it's nice mm -hmm. and primeval, it actually feels like something is really happening. Um, I entered the Orthodox Church on Easter Day Julian calendar, mm -hmm. so it couldn't have, been, couldn't have felt more wonderful. There was a small, my small community was there, and there are Ukrainians and Russians within that community. Talk about having to find, a, you know, some blue That's feather mm -hmm. moment. That's happening in this tiny little community that I'm in. And the moment I had really had that experience, I was dragged out of that and into this extraordinary protracted Canadian tour with, I think, two nights off in three weeks. So I will be back it, tomorrow. I'll be back at uh, Vespers and then I'll be back at Divine Liturgy on Sunday. And in actual fact, I've met up with my spiritual father and I've said, could you send me the list of events really for the next at least the next year and i will arrange any touring schedule around that as best as i possibly can mm -hmm. Good. so mike we yeah. are recently talking about the underworld yeah 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 right? you know it's you know, you've helped so much and i think um martin uh, again promoting your books but also I can't imagine like the number of things we've already touched on in this conversation, but that opening essay to your website uh, is, is really, really deep, but uh, it's something that even came up last week when I think about the underworld, you know, offhand, I'm going to say the next American Catholicism, you know, we've had uh, 2000 years of the sky God, next American Catholicism or the charism of the American Catholicism will be of the land, the underworld under the patronage of our lady of Guadalupe. But of course, all the feminine deities are kind of local all this stuff. Anyhow, that's all in one sense jargon. That being said, um, when we, last week we were talking about the underworld and I found this quote by Rilke, which is on my phone, but this notion that when we, when you go into ourselves, you know, all these things that seem like scary monsters, you know, they're probably just little things needing to be loved. Your work apparently, and I'm not as well read as I should be, but you seem to have a real total genius for this, is seeing a connection between the underworld of ourselves, the things that people are trying to explore with pop psychology and so forth, and the planet, you know, and stories. Um, you know, that if we draw a wonderful picture, if we're just kind of caught up in this, the garbage going on in here, divorced from the planet, we're missing the larger stories. And so your work is so needed now because with the mental health crisis with young people, whether you're talking about individual universities like my own, or the diocese I work in, we know you can't hire your way out of this problem. Um, and your your work seems to have a really healthy, constructive critique of uh, people who, you know, kind of flee to gurus and so forth. You know, but you also have a critique of the people. The distinction between from the land and of the land is true. You had mentioned Wendell Berry. I do a lot of writing for this website called Front Porch Republic. And we talk about localism, but everybody, every so often somebody goes, oh my God, I've met people who know they're, you know, from a land, but they're the worst rat bastards I've ever met. Your work, <laughs> your work is doing a lot of, I would say hard labor, but you cut through it like butter, you know, because I think your emphasis on stories and the underworld 
Um, is there something I said there that could set you off singing your song? Well, first of all, there's something you've mentioned. I haven't actually looked at a website of mine for years, so I don't know what's on it. Uh, uh, is it is? Do you know the title of the essay? I, I, it has you know it has in the, embedded in it is the story of the wolf woman. You know the guy who. Uh, it's got to oh. be you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. It, I'm sure it's me. I just. Yeah, I just so, don't you know, know what it is. You 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 just begin on. The, it's all about the power of stories, and you have you know you have your books. You have videos and so forth, and it says essays. But I thought I'll read a few essays. But there's one essay, and it yeah. seems to like be the uber essay, if you ask me. Well, I, is it? There's an essay I wrote. When I think about the underworld, there's an essay called "We're in the Underworld, but We Don't Know It." That's the important one. Okay, no, I, that this is not it. So I look forward to the fact that it I, might, I suspect the one you've read is called "Small Gods." Okay, yeah, I think so. Uh, that is that's probably eight years ago, and that comes out of uh, a book of mine that I still feel engaged with called Scatlings, Getting Claimed in the Age of Amnesia. And that book was about a chalk circle of 10 miles around from where you live and just digging into that, saying, uh, yeah. you know, my, my mythology is this mythology. As Ken Snyder says, I'm going to be famous for five miles. That website, actually, the, the one for people to look at is called systemistica.com. Okay. Uh, that's where all my books are. And that is that does have more up to date interviews. I think I'll 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 ring whoever deals with my websites when I finished and get it pensioned off. It, <laughs> it really is something from antiquity. I probably <laughs> I I'd probably just about stand for it. But I, I, I don't I just don't know what's up there. Name the uh, the other essay because I'll link to it in our description on the YouTube. The the underworld one that you say is the the go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in the underworld and we don't know it. It's um, I think you can find it on Medium, and it's also it became one of the final sections in a book that I wrote called Courting the Wild Twin. Okay. For people for people that are new to me, I've I've now written about seventeen books in and around this kind of area. You know, the myth of a landscape and the landscape of a myth, really. But if you want, if you're looking for gateway drugs, the gateway drugs are two books, Courting the Wild Twin and a book called Smoke Hole. And they will get you in there in a relatively uncluttered, unfussy fashion. <laughs> yeah. In your in your work um, called Smoke Hole, maybe you can, I think this, link these two things together. Because it reminds me again of Ivan Illich a little bit, but um, you 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 mentioned how you know when did tools become deities? You know that seems to be a seminal thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, again, yeah. Um, it seems to me that when we think of tools, I even think of the market itself. You know the the great work of Karl Polanyi, the Hungarian economist, just said, okay, here's the market. Think of the market as a tool. We used to be able to see it as a tool that we used on Saturday mornings from nine to eleven in this square, the town square outside the church where these rules of supply and exchange, you know, and then we put them away. And then there was the, the gift economy that kind of reigned. So it was a tool we used to kind of set a fire and then it got disembedded, right? The genie got out of the bottle. You seem to have tell us a story with your current wrestling with uh, technology phones and so forth. And it seems to me that this is connected with our calling to re-engage with the underworld. But um, maybe that's a kind of a tall order I just gave you there, Martin. Another thing that I'm working, I'm working on a big book at the moment, and one of the things in it is looking at the notion of the fall, the fall, you know, F-A-L-L, -L, not the autumn, but the big, big biblical fall, and how that relates to the underworld. And maybe we're actually, the underworld has now become so incredibly comfortable, it's more like an airport lounge than Haiti, <laughs> although we all know what it feels like for an airport lounge to feel like hell. You know, it's felt like that pretty recently to me. Do you know, a story that blew my mind was I found a story from the Caucasus, and I'll just give you the a tiny synopsis. It's called The Spyglass. And there's a young princess who says, anyone can marry me if they can, if they can disappear. I have a spyglass that can look out over the whole world and see every single detail in a fraction of a second. But the only person that I will marry is someone that can't be detected by my spyglass. And it's a hunter who has affiliations with an eagle and a goat and a fish and a fox. In the end, he keeps getting found. But in the end, the fox says there is one place 
where the spyglass simply cannot find you. And it's underneath the feet of the daughter. So she's mm. there with her spyglass, but the fox digs a hole. The young hunter gets right underneath the, the woman and then marries her. And a kind of a spell is broken. I think the spyglass actually drops and shatters. And there was some information in that book, in that story for me, about, of course, the spyglass is, you know, it's modernity, it's 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 everything now, it's it's all oh, social media, phones, etc. But we need to find the ground that's right underneath us. In the book Smoke Hole, I made a point of, of pushing that we have a prayer mat underneath us. It's this small, small little patch of earth, and the only job worth taking is inhabiting that small area. And the great thing about inspecting the the prayer mat is it gets us on our knees, which I think is our appropriate position in the universe. You know, it, it opens us up again to the devotional. But I'm coming back, coming back again to a point that I made, you know, half an hour ago, because it's just so incredible. It's it's ridiculously simple. On next Saturday, I'll be in Dublin with Jonathan Peugeot and Paul Kingsnorth. And we're doing two days, I think, uh, on Christ's creation in the cave. And I know the issue of technology will come up. But to be honest, again, I think we have to make a covenant with limit. And you see, this is what you were just saying. When I was growing up, on Sunday, the shops weren't open. Mm -hmm. Everything stopped. We all understood that. There was a poet around here, Peter Redgrove. He insisted, he said, you could wake me up on any day of the week. But if you wake me up on a Sunday, I'll know it's Sunday, not by anybody telling me, but by how it almost vibrationally feels. But vibrationally, we never feel any different anymore because we're 24 mm seven. -hmm. I've said in my own substack recently that the devil is trashing our retinas. We're mm. strung like a cello string between, you know, you know, ordeal and the miraculous. And, and we are, we are so spun out by the tyranny of choice that we now have. Um, and at the same time, grateful as I am for my phone, grateful as I am for my you know, contact with family members and loved ones, it is having a significant effect on my attention span. Significant. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you, I, I, I'm, merc I'm mercifully glad that I wrote a lot of books before I really had a smartphone. Yeah. I found I was reading this the other day. This book is called The Saga of King Hrolf Kraki. I'm reading the book, and this I actually did this. I'm reading it, and without thinking, because I'm a bit short sighted, I start going, Did you? Yeah. You, you yeah. scrolled the book just, just, just for uh, you know, a couple of seconds, but I thought, Oy vey. You know. <laughs> So, so, you know, we can, you know, I would, I would say to people, go out into the woods for four days a year, be like a Halakarahari Bushman, pay attention to the edge of your vision, all of these kind of simple things. Um, mm -hmm. When a culture is in crisis, it's never looking right ahead of you that gives you the solution. It's something on the edge. But I do know that all of this stuff is not going to go away. So we in ourselves, again, have to just... We have to, you know, limit our consumption, which luckily for in, I think in most Christianity worthy of the name is fairly front and center. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's what I, what, what you're describing there is what I've experienced as well. Having not grown up with any of those things is that um, as convenient as having a cell phone and all these things is it gets in the and this is like the spyglass right it gets in the way between you know between the between oneself and the, the sacramental nature of real of nature and of reality and that's what i noticed so i mentioned i'm working on this poetry book that i've been working on it's probably a year and a half that uh and i, I wanted to, i purposely wanted to make this landscape where i live a, you know, a, a feature of all of the poems, or most of the poems anyway. And that was a, that's been, well, it's been a wonderful experience because I, I it's almost as that though I am inhabiting this landscape mythologically in a way. 
if that makes sense. And I, and I, and I, and you, I mean, I don't have to tell Martin Shaw about this, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's, it's something people are deprived of and which it, we're deprived of it now in modernity, but um, generations before took it for granted. It was just, yes, no kidding. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. People see fairies. I know about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Mike, you got anything for us? Oh, just the, um, I guess I was thinking that, you know, your, your notion, Martin, again, about like the local, you, the local that doesn't get, you know, the oven from, um, you also, I think you tie it to, with the use of stories, again, if we were to go to the underworld, your use of stories, you, at one point, I think I can find the quote, maybe it was from the same essay, many stories we are holding close right now have the scream but not the gifts. It's enormous seduction on behalf of the West to suggest that jabbing your pen around in the debris of your pain is enough. It's not. That's uninitiated behavior masquerading as wisdom. That's pretty brilliant, by the way. Thank um, you. Yeah, I took the rest of the day off when I wrote that. I <laughs> and I, yeah. now, I, now, I now know the essay that you're referring to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I said the whole thing's very, 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 very brilliant. The... Um, but I, you know, you're getting at something very important at this time when we're talking about healing that can come from the underworld, healing that can come from stories, healing that comes from silence, healing that comes from the book of nature. Um, we have a whole different religion, a whole different mythology at war with that, that wants us to get stuck in working from our pain. It wants to, it wants to look at the whole realm of stories, like you're very eloquent in that same essay, that it's um, ask 19... Even though you're right, we're in the age of the trendiness of stories again, but ask 19 uh, or 20 people about the origin of stories, and they're still going to come up with the idea that it was to, you know, they saw the rain and they wanted to, you know, it was an uncontrollable thing. It was like early science and so forth. Your, your work, it seems to me, one of the geniuses of your work is to move through getting caught up in that one worldview and move through working from just our anxiety and our fear and our pain. The stories take us somewhere else. If you can kind of sing that song for a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, be beauty pushes us towards truth because when we see beautiful things, we fall in love with them and then we behave differently. We, we act differently. Uh, yeah, no, I never went for that notion. And, and I'm afraid Campbell pushed it a bit as, as did yeah, others. Yeah. But it was a kind of neurotic reaction to the, you know, the kerfuffle of life that we made up these stories, that there was no, no divine influx moving through them. Um, I came into stories from the idea that you went walkabout. And at some point, if you walked and dreamt for long enough, um, the, uh, you'd hear the gossip of the hedgerows, because that's what happened to me. That's just what happened to me. My head got cracked open in that particular fashion. And I've really spent quarter of a century now, right, I, I'm, it's strange because as a writer, as a writer and as writers, plural, you occupy a fairly venerated and understood role in modernity. But as an oral storyteller, you're still an outlaw. Mm. It's like an outlaw art. People still don't really know what it is. There's a kind of nervous giggle that goes to a literary festival when they say, and Martin Shaw, oral storyteller, as well as writer, they don't like it because it seems sort of piratical. I always like there's the poet Rumi says, learn poems by heart because on the page they die of cold. Mm. And so I always like the idea of regathering words. You know how impressive it is when you, you remember the first person you met that could recite a poem to you. Mm -hmm. And without without the use of referring to a book, it's extraordinary. So, uh, yeah, I think for that reason, when you distinguish between even yourself and somebody who greatly admires, I do, Joseph Campbell, it's a distinction with a difference insofar as um, that all this talk of stories at in one musical register can sound like jargon and it can be really annoying, you know? Uh, in, in the Roman Catholic Church, when I was in graduate school, the word Eucharist actually became annoying. You know, when it means everything, it means nothing. In other words, you know, Eucharist this, Eucharist this, Eucharist this. Now we might be having the pendulum in the Roman Catholic Church go tell too far 
this way. Eucharist is just this real, 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 real kind of fetishized presence. But uh, the same thing with stories. It seems so amorphous that it's when, if I repeated the word balloon 20 times, all of a sudden the idea of a balloon becomes ethereal and vanishes away. That I think in pushing through the use of stories in this kind of way that they just came from early kind of a scientific way of dealing something of magic and pushing through coming from our neuroses and our pain, you took the tinny nature out of stories again. It's something I think I greatly needed. <laughs> you know, I just thought most people are talking about stories were those annoying people, to be honest with you. Yes, I, I know what you mean. I mean, the thing about the, there's a contract, there's a contract in myth. And the contract is this story will probably take you way down into the underworld. But the function of an effective storyteller, storyteller as magician, is that they know not just how to open ritual space, but how to close it as well. And yeah. I think a lot of people know how to open big experience. And then they're left when the community goes up in flames or people can't hold it together or everything just descends into sort of promiscuity. You know, big feelings come in and no one knows quite how to manage it. So in other words, and I had to, I was in, I was in Canada on the Canadian trip. I taught for three days and I said, my contract with you is that I will get you out of the other end of this, you know, shaken and stirred, but safe. Because probably by this time tomorrow, you won't feel safe at all. You will feel really discombobulated. And I need you to know that I'm a veteran of this particular process that we're taking down into the into the chthonic, down into the deep interior, down into the underbelly of things. But one of the things that, again, this chap I've mentioned before, psych, uh, therapist James Hillman said, he said, the problem with Christians is he said their attitude in you know modern America is it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so in other words, we don't take the descent seriously enough. And that sense. means we don't absorb the smell, the texture, the despair, what uh, Maradona Same used to call the world turned upside down of it all, because we are so desperate to, to get back to the redemptive as soon as possible. I but just finished his book like three days ago. The Aberdeen Monastery was reading it with me, Somay's book. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mal Maladoma Same, uh, who sadly we've lost recently. I didn't know that. Okay. A, phen a phenomenal teacher, uh, whisked off by the Jesuits from his yeah. tribe when he was young, comes back as a teenager, long past the traditional initiations, but does them as an older man. And I was lucky enough to work with Maladoma on and off for about five years at something called the Minnesota Men's Conference. Uh, and I remember him with just a. Uh, astonishing respect although we had a very unpolitically correct relationship a relationship that in 2023 people would try and cancel because maladoma when that maladoma once introduced me he said i want to introduce you to this phenomenal indigenous teacher that i know ladies and gentlemen martin shaw and everyone just went what and he said well his family had been in the same place for several hundred years he knows where his dead are buried he knows hundreds of stories from that place. He qualifies. That's great. Now, that, that just couldn't happen now. It just could not happen. And I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> and, and, and I actually, and I understand that. But another yeah. thing that Maladoma would do was that Maladoma would listen to me or to others telling fairy tales. And he'd say, hidden in that fairy tale is a bit of technology antique technology that I need for a ritual in the village in Burkina Faso that we haven't quite fixed yet. So I'm just going to take this bit and I'm going to put it over there. And that's the bit that the stranger gave us that helps complete our ritual. It's wild. You're not meant to do things like that. It's not, the world isn't meant to work like that. We have adolescents in universities telling us how storytellers are meant to talk to each other. You know, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> you know, fuck off. we should title uh, this episode you, fuck off that's right you know, you're not you 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 are you not not all opinions are created equal i'm afraid uh and when you get into senior storytelling and senior ceremonialists they they work how they work and it's always been this way 
Pastor. Now, I have a question then. Um, since you've been doing this for a long time, guiding people through these stories, and you talked about uh, the three days in Canada where you said, you know, I'll get you out safely, but it's not going to be safe the whole time. How has that process changed, or maybe it hasn't, since become a, becoming a Christian? I think firstly, and, and this is a caveat you'll understand very well, I, I realized actually what happened with Christianity is I realized I was a Christian all, all along. It's a terrible <laughs> one. I just wasn't a very good one. I wasn't an efficient one. And I certainly hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really consumed certain moral positions that I think a Christian should take. So, so first of all, that just sort of, it sifted through some very dramatic experiences. It sifted into consciousness that, that actually, okay, here's my controversy. Christianity was the big shamanism I'd been looking for for 30 years. Big shamanism. Yeah, it is the big shamanism. You yeah. know, the, 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 the supreme poetic event is the crucifixion. It is shamanism beyond shamanism. Wild supreme poetic event um so how has it changed well the first thing that didn't happen uh is that you know all my mythological stories sort of crumbled into dust around me and all i can now do is is repeat you know <laughs> uh, you know uh the gospel of matthew over and over again uh, by and large the stories have stayed with me because of course they're they're filled with pinpricks of eternity uh i i'm one of those really irritating christians that actually believes in the miracles uh i i think they exist on they're like stained glass they exist on any number of levels christ is almost christ is too much reality <laughs> he's he's too much reality for us to handle so i just go with breadcrumb after breadcrumb Christianity is a very slowly exfoliating flower for me because if I saw it all, I'd just lose my my marbles. Um, so 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 Christianity is the big shamanism that I had dreamt of and never realised it was closer than my own breath. And I think, I mean, everything's changed for me in on a very fundamental level that I have now absorbed what you would call the code of service that comes with Christianity. Uh, in up until now gentlemen confidentially into the world at large i took on a kind of to the victor the spoils position really in in my own work and if it brought money and attractive uh situations and all that that was just wonderful it was just reward for a lot of hard work it was I like attractive situations I'm, I'm really monitoring what i'm saying as, as i do <laughs> It's a pair of other things, but but now it's it's different. I have a governor now. I have a landlord, you know, and uh, and it's funny actually. Someone asked me recently. They said, "What does Christ look like to you?" Maybe I said this to you before. I think I said he's like a a figure moving. He's at the periphery of my vision, moving between trees. That's mm. all I can see. And they said, "Well, you can't base your spiritual life around that." And I said, "I certainly can." Funnily enough, I've now read that. I think Tennessee Williams said something similar. So maybe right. it's a thing. Maybe it's a thing. I don't know. Mm. But how has it changed? Um, I would hope that I'm more patient. I would hope that I'm slightly less vain. Uh, and I think, I think what's happening for me at the moment is it's one thing to celebrate, be absorbed by, and joyously stimulated by the body of Christ as the earth. That's an incredible thing. Whenever people talk to me about the church as the body of Christ, which of course is a, an official position, I always say, but the, the body's at war with itself. You know, the, 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 the liver has cancer. The, it's having a heart attack. All the organs are sort of fighting each other. Could we not, would it not be a fundamentally healthy thing to do to look at the earth, to look at plants, to look at weather, to look at that as a kind of body of Christ? Right. But anyway, where I'm going finally is that I'm now engaged, not just with the creation itself, but with the being that created it and then created 
these countless millions or trillions of planets that we know nothing about. The cosmological, the Christology of my head, by falling into the mind of Christ, as Paul would put it, you know, I realize I'm falling forever now. And I've I've hit a ground of consciousness so vast uh, that it's 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 I'm almost rendered speechless. Yeah. So those are some of the things that I think have changed. <clears throat> Wonderful. Wild. Well, that, that's that's probably a good place to wind it up. Um, so, Martin, um, if people want to find you, <laughs> if, you if you know what your website is, where do they look? Yeah, uh, look look for schoolofmyth.com or systemistica.com. And most of all, actually, if you really want to know what I'm writing and thinking about, uh, my Substack thing is called House of Beasts and Vines. We've got 7,000 people over there now. It's very lively. Um, you know, that would be, that would, if you really want to see what's alive for me, because obviously as an author, often you're waiting several years between writing a book and getting it out. But mm -hmm. Substack, I get to serve you, I get to serve you the the bread while it's hot, you know. Yeah, nice, freshly nice boiled. Think about it. Okay. What a delightful conversation! Thank you. Oh, you too. It's been a, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. For us too. Well, thank you everybody for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. We got a line of good episodes coming up, and thanks again to Dr. Martin Shaw for joining us in a fascinating and wide ranging conversation. We'll have to talk, Michael, about what to entitle it. <laughs> because it was so many have a good week everybody we'll see you next week <laughs>